to the Lenten series at Prince George Winya. My name is Rob Sturdy. I'm the Anglican chaplain to the Citadel and the Corps of Cadets, uh, where I'm also a graduate of the class of 2003, and I'm really uh, proud and, and blessed to be back serving that college community at the Citadel, and I'm also really excited to be participating in this Lenten series. Uh, I was uh, always pleased to hear from, from my friend and your rector, Gary Beeson, uh, to participate, and also excited about uh, the topic of exploring the Anglican heritage and the development of doctrine and worship through the lens of the prayer book, and it's fitting that you're doing this uh, this year, uh, at the 300th anniversary of your parish. I congratulate you. Uh, it's uh, fitting that you would spend this time thinking about the faithfulness of Christ to your parish uh, over many generations, uh, also the faithfulness of Christ uh, expressed through the development of our own Anglican heritage. So, we can't do justice to the topic that I have been asked to uh, cover, which is the 1549 Book of Common Prayer, the first English prayer book of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, in the time that we have, we can achieve a few things. We can set the scene for those that will be following me in the coming weeks, to discuss the Protestant Reformation as it came to England because these early English prayer books are not developed in a vacuum, but they are developed within the tumultuous events 
of the Protestant Reformation as it came to England. So we can set the scene on that. We can talk about a few major features of the 1549 prayer book. Uh, one, by its conspicuous absence, one by its presence, and then an overarching theme. I hope that this gives you a deeper appreciation of your Anglican heritage on this very important anniversary. But more than that, I hope that we're able to achieve uh, something that I think our Anglican fathers would want to achieve. When Thomas Cranmer and Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer and William Tyndale and many others set out to participate in the course of events that we would come to know as the Protestant Reformation, they did not intend to make good Anglicans. They didn't intend to found a national denomination. It would stun them, although I think they would be pleased that we're still using some of the same prayers that they wrote 500 years later. More than anything else, though, these men and many women, when they participated in the Protestant Reformation, uh, wanted to make you more mature, vital, lively Christians, not Anglicans, Christians. They wanted what William Tyndale said in his preface to the Holy Scripture was for you to have an experience of the gospel so rich that it would make you happy down to the low bottom of your soul. So, more than anything else, I hope we can continue to contribute to that goal, which was their goal uh, in this brief time that we have together. So, to begin with, uh, I don't begin with a reading from the Book of Common Prayer from 1549, but I actually begin with a reading from a book that was published uh, about a hundred years later, the most, until recently, the most popular English printed book of all time. And, of course, you may know that's John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. As I walk through the wilderness of this world, I lighted on a certain place, where was a den, and I laid me down in that place to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed, and behold, I saw a man, clothed with rags, standing in a certain place, with his face from his own house, a book in his hand, and a great burden upon his back. I looked and saw him open the book and read therein, and as he read, he wept and trembled. Not being able longer to contain, he break out, with a lamentable cry, saying, What shall I do? If you've read John Bunyan's allegory, The Pilgrim's Progress, you know that the book that came into the pilgrim's hand was the Bible, and it was the reading of the Bible that set off the chain of events that caused the pilgrim to get up and leave his home city and to set out on a journey that would bring him at the foot of the cross. And if you've read that moving account, it's seeing the cross on the hillside that causes the great burden on his back to tumble down the hill and into the tomb. It's reading this book that set him on the adventures battling uh, forces of evil and demons and giants and sin. And it's the reading of this book that eventually brought him to become a citizen of that heavenly city uh, where the Lord Jesus reigns at the right hand of the Father. It was the reading of the book that changed everything. And what you need to know is that in the pre-Reformation period, the late medieval period, the people of Europe collectively had an encounter with the book that was transformative. And it would change the fabric of Western civilization permanently. How did the encounter with the book begin? Well, it began with uh, the rediscovery of what came to be called the humanistic arts. Now, if you hear the word humanism now, you might be thinking secular humanism. But when we talk about humanism in the 16th century, uh, these things could not be farther from the truth. The humanists of uh, the Renaissance, and the Renaissance comes from the Latin renacita, which means to be reborn. So Europe is having a rebirth. Well, a rebirth of what? A rebirth of learning. And it's a humanist rebirth because they're studying human things like what? Language and poetry. If you want to read uh, the epics of Homer or the poetry of Virgil, 
you have to acquaint yourself with the ancient languages. And it just so happens that the desire to reacquaint with ancient languages was matched with the ability to do so as uh, language manuals came to us uh, from uh, refugees from the Ottoman invasions. They brought with them ancient texts. They brought with them manuals of language. They also brought with them key texts of the New Testament in Greek. That's very important. You're going to remember that later. And so uh, there's, there's this intense study of human things, languages, that allows people to read untranslated works for the first time in many hundreds of years. And guess what one of those untranslated works is that they're able to read? Uh, the New Testament. And when I say untranslated, of course there was a, a Latin translation called the Vulgate, which is, uh, I use actually the Latin Vulgate occasionally in my own devotions. And it's a very fine translation given to us by the uh, early church father, Jerome. And he translated it into Latin because Latin was the common language of the people. Jerome, when he translated these texts uh, from the Greek into the Latin, the Hebrew into the Latin, his goal was to make the, the scriptures as widely available to the people uh, of the world as possible. So it's called the Vulgate, from the Latin vulgar, which just means common. But uh, over time, Latin became less common. And so the scriptures became more inaccessible to larger groups of people. Well, all of a sudden you have the ability now with an educated class that not just can read the Bible in Latin, but they're beginning to read the Bible in Greek as well because they have these manuscripts. And they're reading this book and the experience they have reading this book may be hard for you to understand But it's an amazing experience of reading, reading the words of Jesus without a mediator. What do I mean by that? If you were a medieval Christian, the experience of your Christianity was a lot of mediation between you and God. If you had a sin problem, it was mediated through the priest. If you wanted to experience God himself, the closest you could do was to participate in the Mass but you would probably not be uh, eating the bread or drinking the wine. In fact, you're prohibited from drinking the wine. The most you could hope to have an experience of God in the Mass was that you would see the moment when the medieval Christians believed that the bread for the communion was transformed into the body of Christ. The minister would hold it into the air and say, hoc est corpus meum, and you could see a miracle, but you would see it from far back in the church. So the medieval Christians felt far from God, and the experience they had encountering God was, was mediated. And that it actually includes when those who could read the Bible, when they read the Bible, it felt mediated as well, because they were not reading the words of Jesus in the language Jesus said them in. They were reading them in Latin. Just to give you an example of this, um, there's a Roman Catholic cardinal in Spain. And his name is Jimenez, and as the Greek New Testaments come through Spain, and he reads them in Greek, he offers a, a, a new printed Greek New Testament alongside the Latin Vulgate to the Pope, uh, and, and he needed to explain himself, and this is what he said. There are many reasons, Holy Father, that impel us to print the language of the original text of Holy Scripture. These are the principal ones. Words have their own unique character. No translation of them, complete, can entirely express their full meaning. This is especially the case in the language the Lord himself spoke. So I'll just stop there. Now you, can you hear the desire to have an unmediated experience with Jesus? We want to read the words the Lord himself spoke. We want to read the words that the Holy Spirit himself inspired when he moved the pens of the authors of Scripture. But this theme is developed. The letter here of itself may be dead and like flesh, which profits not, for it's the Spirit that gives life. 
Christ concealed by the form of the words, he's talking about the Latin translation, remains enclosed in the womb. But there's no doubt there's a rich fecundity so astonishing and an abundance of sacred mysteries so teeming that since it is ever full to overflowing, streams of living water shall flow out from his breast. From this source, those to whom it has been given to behold the Lord of glory with unveiled face. What is the veil? Take away the veil of the Latin. Let us read the Greek so that we can see the glory of the Lord unveiled and that we could be transformed into that very image and we could continually draw the marvelous secrets of his divinity. Since, however, the most learned translator can present only a part of this, the full scripture and translation inevitably remains up to the present time, laden with a variety of sublime truths which cannot be understood from any other source but the original. So they have this transformative experience uh, with the scriptures, uh, and these, these two themes meet. All of a sudden they have the skill to read the Greek, which they had not had from hundreds of years. And it's matched with a desire to uh, have an unmediated experience with the original scriptures. Well, that had some consequences, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But for now, uh, I just want to say that um, once they began to read the Greek, uh, there were translations offered. And the translators did not take the opinion that the glory of the Lord was, would be hidden behind a translation. The translators took the opinion that if they, they made a sincere attempt at the Greek to render it into their own language, that not just learned people like clergy or scholars could have a, an experience of God's word, but they thought everyone can now have an experience with God's word. And that brings us to the 1549 prayer book and the preface of the 1549 prayer book, which I will read to you now. There was never anything by the wit of man so well devised or so surely established, which in continuance of time hath not been corrupted. So what's he saying? He's saying, uh, when we put our plans in place, give it time and things will begin to break down. What did Cranmer wrote this? What did Cranmer think had broken down? Well, as among other things, it may plainly appear by the common prayers in the church. The common prayers of the church had broken down. Commonly called divine service. The first and original ground whereof, if a man would search out the ancient fathers, which Cranmer did, he's a renowned patristic, which means early church theologian scholar, he shall find that the same was not ordained but of good purpose and for great advancement of godliness, they so ordered the matter that the whole of the Bible should be read over once a year. So let me stop there and just say at Cranmer's time, and we can say in his own words, at Cranmer's time, the reading of the Bible had been broken up, he says, these many years have passed, this godly and decent order of ancient fathers have been so altered, broken, and neglected by planting in uncertain stories legends, responds, verses, vain repetitions, commemorations, synodals, commonly when any book of the Bible was begun. Before three or chapters were read out, all the rest went unread. So, <laughs> I mean, I think that's still true. The lectionary tradition of our Anglican Church right now is interrupted continually by saints' days and feast days and and now, beginning a few chapters, you move to another book by the end of the week. Well, Cranmer said that the ancient fathers had the practice of reading through the entire Bible with their congregation every year. And Cranmer said this is what this 1549 prayer book is meant to recover. Why? Uh, intending that the clergy, and especially such as were ministers of the congregation, should by often reading and meditation of God's word be stirred up to godliness themselves, be more able also to exhort other by wholesome doctrine, to confute them that were adversaries to the truth, and further that the people, by daily hearing of Holy Scripture read in the church, should continually profit more and more in the knowledge of God, 
and be more inflamed with the love of his true religion. So, the vision of the prayer book in uh, the lectionary, the, the daily reading, is that we would annually, as, as a people of God, move through the entire scriptures. Why? Because uh, the reformers had had personally transformative experiences with the scripture. And they wanted to push that out into the public sphere. It's read because you have an illiterate public. Because you have an illiterate public, you bring them to the church and you read it to them in their language so they can have the transformative experience. As you can imagine, translating the scriptures uh, into English was resisted by some because they did not think lay people could understand it. Uh, They might make mistakes. But Cranmer had the confidence to say, and you can read this in his sermon on Holy Scripture, that if lay people are confused by Scripture, God himself will either send someone or come himself by his spirit and help them understand it. They were so committed to this that the English reformer William Tyndale effectively died uh, for his scriptures to be translated into English. He died a gruesome death. He was strangled on a post. And as he died, he prayed, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. That was his last words. So the prayer book that we have in English is precious, more precious to the English reformers is that you have a Bible in English. Well, what did reading the Bible do to the devotional life and practice of English Christians? Well, one of the key things that has happened, which is seen in the 1549 prayer book by its absence, is the penitential life of the church. When Jesus begins his ministry in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, He says, uh, repent and believe the good news for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what our English translations say. What did the Latin Vulgate say upon which uh, the theology and doctrine of the medieval Roman Catholic Church had been built? Well, the Latin Vulgate, which uh, I, I, I maintain is a very fine translation, said, Ecchende cipit Jesus predicare et dicere, penitentiam agite atropinquavit enim regnum celorum. Now, I'm guessing not many of you actually know what I just said, but I'm going to hone in on something that, that, I, that is very important. Penitentiam agite. What does that mean? Well, if you were to translate that uh, into English, it would say, at that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Do penance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I've not studied Jerome enough to know what he meant by penitentian agite, but I have studied uh, the medieval church and the pre-Reformation church extensively, and I do know what they meant, penitentian agite, stood for. Uh, It was to participate in the penitential system of the Roman Catholic Church. And that brings me to the penitential season of Lent and the beginning of that penitential season, which is Ash Wednesday. By the time of the, of the pre-Reformation, a very important aspect of penance, uh, doing works of mercy and justice and restitution, was understood that that penance could remit sins and time from purgatory. Well, what does that mean? Purgatory, in its early medieval expressions, and you might think of Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy, of which is a trilogy, of course, you know, the Inferno, and the Purgatorio, and the Paradiso. Well, it's the Purgatorio that I'd like to draw your attention to. One of the things that surprised me the first time I read through Dante Alighieri's Purgatorio is the people in Purgatory are not sad. They're very happy people. Because Purgatory is a place of purging. You think of people uh, sometimes um, 
you know, modern people in, in, just, in the fitness and health movements, they, they, they do a cleansing or a purging, like a juice cleanse or a juice purge or something like this. I, I don't, but, I, but you get the idea, right? So the idea is that purgatory is a place where you're purged of arrogance and anger. And the people that Dante meets in purgatory are always very happy because they know they're going to be in heaven and they're being purged of their sins right now. Not forgiven, they've already been forgiven, right? But they're being made into people who can bear the weight of glory. It's, it's a really beautiful image. But by the late medieval period, this had changed. And uh, purgatory had been, become a place, not of training for heaven, but a place of torture, where you were tortured to pay for your sins. And, uh, and there, unlike, unlike the early doctrine where you are on a journey through purgatory that surely ends in heaven, the late medieval doctrine, you may never get out of purgatory. So people are intensely interested in participating in the penitential system of the church for themselves and for their deceased relatives so that uh, they can get time off of purgatory. Well... When they, read the, when they read the scriptures in the Greek, they, they see that what Jerome had translated as penitentium agite, do penance, and the Greek is metanoiete. Uh, and metanoiete, uh, it, it, it comes from two different words, meta, which means to change, and noeo, which means mind. And as they grappled with this, they said, well, metanoiete doesn't mean to participate in a penitential system at all. It, it, it's an inward spiritual attitude. Change my mind about what? Change my mind about sin. Be sorrowful for the way that I, I have lived my life and turn away from it. But turn away to what? Well, what does Jesus say? Repent and believe the good news, right? What is the good news? Well, I said it earlier. When William Tyndale said the good news is the news of Jesus' victory over sin and death and hell and the devil. And it makes you glad to the low-down bottom of your soul. So anything that would diminish the, or hint that the victory of Jesus on the cross wasn't enough became public enemy number one in the eyes of the Reformers. And so, did you know the very first liturgical reform that Thomas Cranmer identified was Ash Wednesday? It's, uh, it's not in the 1549 Book of Common Prayer. Neither is it in the 1552 or the 1559 or the 1662. In fact, Ash Wednesday doesn't show up in Anglican liturgical practice until 1979. Why? Well, partly, Cranmer wanted to remove superstition around things like palms and ashes. But I think the greater target in mind, I think the greater target in mind was that Cranmer and his allies wanted to destroy the idea that we are sanctified and forgiven and purged by our efforts. And they wanted to enshrine, it's only by the effort of Jesus Christ that we're sanctified, forgiven, and cleansed. And this comes across really clearly in a sermon by John Jewell, which of course is much later than the 49th prayer book, but I'll read you a section. We be sanctified and made holy by the offering up of the body of Jesus done once and for all, with the one oblation of his blessed body and precious blood, he made us perfect forever and ever, all them that are sanctified. Now this, this next line is the money line, as they say. This then is the purgatory wherein all Christians must put their whole trust and confidence, nothing doubting. Don't put your trust in Lent to purge you. Don't put your trust in Ash Wednesday to purge you. No. Our purgatory, what purges us, is what Jesus did on the cross. That's the first thing, conspicuous by its absence. Now, Gary told me I had 
25 to 30 minutes. I see I have five minutes left. What a tragedy. I could spend a lot of time, but I can't on what comes next. The second thing about the 1549 prayer book is, um, is this prayer that will be familiar to you, that I'm sure you love. And I will just very briefly point out something that I hope is edifying. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We be not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son and to drink his blood in these holy mysteries that we may continually dwell in him and he in us, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood. There was a debate, a famous debate, in the House of Lords about the doctrine of Holy Communion. What does it mean to say we eat the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there was a doctrine that emerged in the English Reformation. It's, it's very hard to figure out where exactly it comes from. Some scholars attribute it to Nicholas Ridley. Some attribute it to Martin Bootser. Some to Peter Martyr Vermigli. Some say the English Reformers uh, learned it from John Calvin, who they were in close contact with. Some say it was from Thomas Cranmer. But the point is, uh, this doctrine of double eating means this. That while you are fed with food in the mouth, you are at the same time being fed spiritual food to the soul. And in this understanding, the bread and the wine are, while not the actual body of Jesus, are nevertheless catalysts that ignite the soul to appreciate that it is actually, not metaphorically, actually, the soul is actually feeding on the body and blood of Jesus. So there's the double eating Where's the double eating enshrined in the prayer that I just read you? Well, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood. The next time that you take communion, and I don't know when that will be, when we can have a traditional, real communion, I would encourage you, if your parish serves bread, to get a big piece of bread. And if your parish serves wine from the chalice, to have a big drink of wine. And as you appreciate uh, the taste in the mouth and the rich warmth of the port wine, uh, Cranmer envisioned that this would activate something in you, that your soul is being fed. And your soul is being warmed as well. So, maybe now you have a better appreciation of the 1549 prayer book. And in doing so, maybe you have a better appreciation of your own Anglican heritage. But I'm more interested um, in assisting you to be more mature, vital Christians. So, what can we say in light of what we've heard today? Thing number one. Read God's Word yourself. I've been ordained since 2006. Too many Christians uh, have English Bibles in, in good, easy, unencumbered translations that they just leave on the shelf. Do not let the clergy explain the Christian faith to you. They're your guides and your shepherds but you can have an encounter with God in His Word. That's thing number one. Thing number two, 
there are a variety of religious practices that are extremely useful. There are a lot of moral uh, activities that we're commanded to do in Scripture. But we are to trust in nothing other than the work and effort of Jesus Christ for our salvation, for our adoption, for our sanctification, and uh, for our eventual interest into the kingdom of heaven, you see. Dedicate yourself to trusting Christ alone. And uh, last but not least, um, our liturgical tradition is very rich. Be a contemplative, thoughtful participant in it. Recognize the double washing in baptism, where a, a literal body is being cleansed with literal water. But at the same time, there's a spiritual washing. Think about the double feeding of communion where literal bodies are feeding on literal bread that will be broken down and become part of them. But at the same time, the soul is literally feasting on the body of Christ, which is also becoming broken down and made part of the soul so that Christ can dwell in us, participate in us, and be born in us. These are all useful things that I hope has helped you. I wish you a very happy 300th anniversary. Thank you for letting me be a participant in this.